So, Zeke and everyone else watching, uh, welcome to our year-end wrap-up of The Climate Brink. How's it going? It's going good. Just uh, spent some time away with the family, got a little bit of recharge after what's been a, a tough year in many ways. Um, so Yeah. Uh, all right. So, what do you think is the biggest story of 2024? In terms of climate? Yeah, I mean, there's... in terms of climate. There's a lot of big ones, but I think one that we might agree on is is certainly the U.S. election has been a, a big part of the climate narrative. Um, right. So I want to be careful a little bit how I talk about it, because I feel like some people have framed it as, you know, the our opportunity to you know meet our climate goals is more or less over. You know, this is the, the end of the livable climate, et cetera. And you know, when it comes to climate change, it's it's certainly not good news. The, the new administration is, is probably going to roll back a lot of the progress that we made in the previous administration. But the world is big. The U.S. is a small part of that. And the climate is long. And four years is a small part of that. And so, you know, while I think this is, is certainly a setback for ambitious decarbonization, uh, I think we should resist sort of seeing it as game over in any way. Yeah, no, I, thought I put the election down as my number one story also. Um, I think it's it's, uh, you know, as 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 an American, uh, I worry a lot about what this is going to do to America standing in the world. And I think that what if the Trump administration really does roll back a lot of the things that Biden implemented <clears throat> in the reduction inflation reduction act uh, and, and sort of does things, you know, kills climate research and does sort of all of the other things they're really going to be handing you know, the, 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 one of the most important economic sectors of the 21st century to China, which is mm -hmm. energy. Uh, they're basically saying here, no, you take the future of energy because China is building, you know, they're scaling up their renewable energy infrastructure. They're installing renewable energy. They're yep. building out their electric vehicle manufacturing capability. I mean, the U S I think the, the, the risk here is that the U S is going to be, one of just a few countries that still relies on fossil fuels, which are dirty and expensive, and it's going to put us at this enormous political disadvantage. I mean, U.S. car companies are, are eventually just, if you know, if they don't develop electric cars, they're just going to be selling cars in the U.S. More than half of new cars bought in China these days are electric, and China uh, in this past year invested over $600 billion, with a B, in energy transition technologies, you know, primarily renewable energy, electric vehicles, transmission, nuclear, things like that, uh, roughly twice what the U.S. spent. Uh, and so they are making a bet in a big way that, you know, a lot of the economy of the 21st century is going to be driven by clean energy and that they want to be the one selling that to the world. And so I agree. You know, I think the U.S. puts itself at a, a pretty big competitive disadvantage if we don't, you know, at least keep up with China and ideally exceed them and, and you know, become a powerhouse in our own right to export our technologies to the rest of the world. Um, I mean, the one thing that does give me a little bit of hope in is that the sort of the pace of clean energy innovation and cost declines marches on, you know, battery costs declined by a record amount this year in terms of percent. Um, you know, we spent over $2 trillion globally. So almost as much, we've spent almost as much globally on clean energy in 2024 as we spent on global military spending. Uh, not quite. I was hoping we'd pass that mark because it'd be a, a really cool thing to celebrate. We'll pass it in 2025, but we're really close at, at over $2 trillion. Um, and uh, as you mentioned, a lot of this technology is, is increasingly cheap. And, and that means that even if there is a unfavorable policy environment, we're still going to see a lot of it built. You know, we might see more in the way of Texas than California, but Texas has built a hell of a lot of solar and wind and batteries now. Uh, despite having a government that is not particularly favorable to any of those. Um, it actually reminds me a bit of back in the first Trump term, I wrote a, a piece uh, called Trump's War on Coal, because uh, Trump had famously come in in 2016 uh, saying he's going to end the war on coal and you know restore greatness to the coal industry in America. And we actually saw a faster rate of coal retirements under Trump than we did under Obama, not because Trump was against coal. In fact, he rolled back most of the environmental rules that you know were hurting coal, but simply because it wasn't economically competitive. Uh, and so I don't think that underlying reality is going to change here. All right. So what are other uh, other big climate stories in, in from last year? So I think this is definitely the year where 
two related climate debates exploded in a big way. Um, one is on this question of is global warming accelerating? You know, is the world warming faster now than it has been sort of at the rate it's been warming since 1970, which previously had been pretty linear at about uh, a little below 0.2 C per decade. Um, and the other debate, and we can dive into each of these separately, is around why global temperatures have been so hot, particularly in the last two years. You know, 2023 was memorably gobsmackingly bananas in the summer. And I think it's safe to say that 2024s remain warmer longer than any of us expected it to. Uh, certainly, it's going to be on the high end of all of our estimates of where the year would end up uh, at the start of the year. Uh, and because of that, it's going to be the first year above 1.5 degrees in, in most data sets. Uh, and so we're going to be talking a lot about that uh, come the start of next year when they all formally get released. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I've i come to the conclusion the last couple of months that <clears throat> I, I'm not sure we should have made as big a deal out of 2023 and 2024 with respect to like the piece that I think you and Gavin wrote about like we can't explain it. I think that because I can't tell you how many calls from reporters I get about what's going on, why why can we not explain it? And ultimately, uh, it, it's interesting. You know, the fact that it keeps getting warmer, we keep setting records. There's nothing, un there's nothing mysterious about that. It's you know the ba it's the slow baseline warming, and then you add on top of it a bunch of other things. But you know, ultimately. I, 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 unless unless we find out that there that we've really changed some fundamental state of the climate system, I think that it it it, um, it distracts from the fundamental role that, that human climate change is playing in this because we're trying to look at is it marine clouds is it mm -hmm. hunga tunga um, it's it's just I, I I think just just I'm kind of I'm kind of wish we hadn't made that big a deal out of it. <laughs> Because uh, I mean, you know what? You know, in the session you you chaired at the AGU meeting, it, it, there was essentially I walk out, I kind of walked out of that thinking exactly what I walked in thinking. Like I, I was hoping that someone would say, "Here's the answer." But it was all there's a bunch of factors. A bunch of them are kind of hundredths of a degree or maybe a tenth of a degree, and you know maybe we can kind of close it. Maybe we can't. Yeah, uh, I mean. S certainly, uh, I was sort of joking throughout the conference that by the, the end of the AG, we we're going to have explained 200% of the anomaly in, in the last two years. But I hear where you're coming from, right? You know, as uh, Michael Mann is fond of saying, you know, what we expect is bad enough. There are, long has been a big question of, it was 2024 and 2023 for that matter, uh, a blip? So uh, an anomalous El Nino combined with some other short-term variability, that drove temperatures higher than we'd normally expect, but that'll recover back down to the new abnormal of an, an ever warming world driven by human activity? Or are there structural changes, you know, changes in forcings, like we've been talking about with shipping aerosols and Chinese aerosols, um, changes in feedbacks potentially around cloud behavior in response to warming world that would tend to indicate something going forward for the climate, either potentially a faster rate of warming than some of our scenarios expect because the forcings might be changing faster than expected, or potentially higher climate sensitivity if, say, cloud feedbacks are responding, you know, more strongly than the typical climate model anticipated. I think it's certainly premature to know for sure about any of those, but I think those are, are very scientifically important questions. I also think that in some ways, the last two years have been the world catching up a little bit to where our models thought they would be. You know, we don't talk about it that much, but over the last decade or so, you know, we been a little on the low end of the range of projections from climate models. Um, you know, back in 2016, it sort of went back up to the, the mean, um, but not well above it as we'd expect in El Nino year. And so, you know, maybe this is the climate catching up a little bit to where our models expect it to be given the forcings to date. And, and there is, you know, the end of some suppressing natural variability at play. I, I don't know. Um, but I think it's scientifically interesting, but you're right that the bigger story here is the human contribution to long-term warming. Uh, and whether or not we're a tenth of a degree or two tenths of a degree off in our long-term projection matters a lot less than the, the direction we're going right now. I had a couple other big stories for 24. Um, I think the uh, continued, uh, uh, which you mentioned earlier, the continued drop in the price of clean energy technology is is really one of the underappreciated things. You know, the price of batteries is plummeting. Remarkable. And then the other thing, which I thought was a big story, was uh, the insurance markets. I think insurance 
it, everybody now realizes, the end of 2024, everybody realizes this is this looming, if not already here, catastrophe. There's been some really tremendous um, uh, uh, journalists working on the problem. Washington Post, the New York Times, Houston Chronicle have had really good stories, really showing that if you live in a place where the climate risk is high, you pay more insurance. This is something that every property owner, every property owner knows about insurance. And, you know, we're always paying insurance. We don't want to pay more insurance. And I think this is a this is going to be maybe the place where people suddenly realize, uh, you know, oh, crap, you know, climate change is bad and it's going to be expensive. Uh, the insurance markets are, are definitely real. And as someone who lives in a fire prone region of California, uh, there's a lot of chatter in the neighborhood about, you know, people's insurance dropping them or the price going up or how to switch to, to reduce costs. Uh, and in some ways, we're lucky here because California has a pretty robust backstop system for, for fire, at least. You know, if you live in somewhere like Florida, good luck getting insured in some areas. Um, well, I mean, they do have a uh, they do have an insurer of last resort, um, hmm. but it's expensive. And so, I mean, it's like you can get the insurance. But it's 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 like a second mortgage, and yep. you know you can you can imagine all of the knock on effects, how that's going to drive down property values, defaults will go up. I mean, it's going to be it's, this is going to be a bad scene. Yep. I mean, I, we already pay six thousand dollars a year for fire insurance where I live, which is kind of crazy. Um, but to your point on clean energy getting cheap, uh, a, a side project that I worked on that came out a couple weeks ago now, uh, in in the latter part of the year, uh, was around potentially using some of this super cheap clean energy, solar and, and battery storage in particular, uh, to deal with the upcoming huge energy demand of artificial intelligence. Um, because you know, artificial intelligence is, is a useful tool in many ways. I've certainly been using it a lot for, for data visualization and things like that, but it's a giant energy hog. Um, the genie's a bit out of the bottle there. You know, as We can complain about it, but these companies are gonna build data centers. And so the question is, is that gonna spike up gas demand? Or is there a way to do it with more you know, clean energy? And so we were kind of surprised. We did a, a quick study on this with some folks with uh, scale microgrids and PACES. Um, and what we found is that clean energy has gotten so cheap now that it's actually not that much more expensive to power your data center with 90% solar and storage and with some gas backup for, for when you know you can't do the solar and storage bit. Uh, yeah, no, I think it's, it's going to be really interesting to see what happens. You know, my concern is um, that uh, politicians who are essentially owned by fossil fuels uh, will use this as an excuse to try to push and foist fossil fuels on us, to lock us in. Because, you know, once you build the infrastructure, uh, it's a lot harder to stop using it. Um, all right. So what do you think is the big story for 2025? That is a big question. Um, I think part of it is going to be a continuation of the story of abnormal warmth, and hopefully the temperatures in 2025 will tell us something. Uh, you know, how much of the the jump in temperatures in recent years is a short-term variability versus a long-term forced response. And the longer it continues, the, the more likely it is to be a forced response. So I think that'll be interesting. I think how the world responds to the Trump administration, um, if the U.S. pulls out of the Paris Agreement, uh, how landmark legislation like the Inflation Reduction Act fares, which there doesn't seem to be much desire to repeal it totally. You know, it, it's sending hundreds of billions of dollars to, to red states uh, for bad, giant battery manufacturing plants, electric vehicle manufacturing plants, and other things like that. But I certainly think some parts of it, maybe incentives for offshore wind, incentives for electric vehicle purchases might go by the wayside and, and how big those cuts are, are certainly going to affect U.S. emissions. Um, I think there's going to be a lot of interesting and complicated debates around permitting reform for energy infrastructure and how we think about that. You know, Arguments that certain things should be exempted from various environmental rules that potentially could be advantageous for clean energy because we need so much transmission but also could help speed up the, the construction of oil and gas infrastructure. And so I think uh, there's certainly been a lot of debates in the climate community around those issues in the coming year. Yeah, so, so my sort of story for 25, which is sort of a continuation of what happened in 24, was sort of the growth of alternative reality, um, mm -hmm. you know, fake news and alternative facts. You know, I, I guess, 
20 years ago, I, I had the naive idea that one day everybody would look out their window and say, holy crap, the climate's changing. This is bad. We got to do something about it. And, I, and now it's quite clear that's never going to happen. I mean, we're still arguing over, you know, COVID and whether the vaccines worked or uh, and, and I think the incentive for a lot of people is just to continue denying the existence of climate change and or, or the impacts of climate change. And I, I think, it, you know, we could be up to here in water uh, and they'd still be saying, nope, I'm completely dry. Um, it's, it's just, and so I, I kind of wonder what's going to happen. I mean, as, as a society, we can't really solve problems if you can't debate about the facts. You know what, when you go to a scientific meeting and you're arguing with somebody, you and that person agree on 99.999% of the facts. You're arguing over this little point way out on the edge. And, you know, you go to Twitter and you argue with people, and I mean, it's just like they don't accept anything. I mean, how, if you don't if you don't start with some basis of knowledge, how do you have any kind of debate? And um, you know, I, I really worry about our ability to solve problems if we can't if there's no sort of shared sense of reality. Um, I guess we'll see we'll see what happens in twenty five with that. Yeah, certainly the last year hasn't been, and to be honest, the last eight years haven't been particularly reassuring about our ability to to come together and agree on even basic things. That's right. That's right. Um, all right, Zeke, well, let's wrap it up here. Uh, it's been great writing the climate brink with you for the last year. And uh, I look forward to seeing uh, everything you write in 25 and we'll see how our uh, predictions, our predictions come. <laughs> you too, Andy. Uh, cheers and enjoy the new year. Yeah. Happy new year.